Good evening uh, and welcome to the storehouse in Northern Ireland. Thank you for joining us tonight for our message. The title tonight is To Him Who Overcomes. To Him Who Overcomes. He may be sung in the past week one of the Easter songs, the greatest day in history. Death is beaten, you have rescued me. Sing it out, Jesus is alive. The empty cross, the empty grave, life eternal, you have won the way. Shout it out, Jesus is alive. You have won the day, Jesus has won the day. And I've had to wait a week to say that. Last week we looked at the cross and I left on Saturday at the cross and I had to wait to today to say, he's not there, he is risen. He is risen. The testimony, he is risen, changes everything, doesn't it? Matthew 28 and verse 6, he is not here for he is risen just as he said. Just as he said, come see the place where he lay. Isn't that wonderful? He's not here, he's risen. Just as he said, come see the place where he lay. It was just as he said it would happen. Paul got the opportunity one time to preach in a place called Pisidian Antioch. You can read about it in Acts chapter 13. The leaders of the synagogue had sent word to him and his, his brothers and said, Brothers, if you have a word of exhortation for the people, please speak. So the platform was his. What was he going to choose to speak on? If that was you, if you have a word of exhortation for the people out there, what would you speak? Well, let's see what Paul said. It tells us in Acts 13, it tells us basically he recalls Old Testament history and he culminates or brings it to the point of Jesus Christ. Now that's good. Do you remember um, how all the Old Testament, remember it's the Old Testament Paul had to preach from, how the Old Testament all points to Jesus Christ. Do you remember Luke chapter 24, where the two disciples were trudging along after the resurrection, they were demoralized, their, their saviour had died and they hadn't quite understood the, the truth of the resurrection, their eyes had been closed and Jesus catches up with them and starts talking to them about it. And it says, I find the place, it says, Jesus says to them, O oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe, all that the prophets have spoken. We saw how the prophet Isaiah had spoken about him last week. He says, Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and enter into his glory? And it says, I'm beginning with Moses. What's that? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he expounded onto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. In other words, the Old Testament's all about him. He's taught all, he showed them all about himself. The word for expounded here literally in Greek means to translate from one language into the common vernacular, the common uh, language of the people. In other words, they started to understand, he started to show them uh, what it all meant. How, for they hadn't yet seen how the Old Testament was all about Jesus. No wonder they said a few verses later, were not our hearts burning within us as he talked to us by the way and opened the scriptures to us. So the Old Testament is about Jesus, that was just by the way. <laughs> so he recalls, Old Paul chooses to recall Old Testament history and he brings it to the point of Jesus. Then in Acts 13 verse 27, it says, the people of Jerusalem and their rulers did not recognize Jesus Yet in condemning him, they fulfilled the words of the prophets that are read every Sabbath. Though they find no proper ground for a death sentence, said Paul, they asked Pilate to have him executed and put out of the way. Isn't that interesting? They want to put Jesus out of the way. And that's what people want to do today, isn't it? Put Jesus out of the schools, put Jesus out of politics, put Jesus out of this and that. And that's why I was proud of David Cameron to stand up recently and say that Britain is a Christian nation. Like it got a lot of backlash, 50 signatures from atheists and humanist society saying it's not. But I declare tonight Britain, to those in the nation, Britain is a Christian nation and the Christians need to wake up and they need to rise up and they need to start evangelizing and reaching out to their neighborhoods. 
Anyway, they wanted to put Jesus out of the way. But when they had carried out all that was written about him, said Paul, they took him down from the cross and laid him in a tomb. Then verse 30, he says, but God raised him from the dead the third day. But God raised him. The message of the resurrection is a message of victory. It's a message of overcoming. It's a message Jesus won the day. Jesus won the day. And you've probably heard me before mention the late Dr. Lockridge, the pastor of Calvary Baptist Church in San Diego, California. It was in 1976 that he was preaching a sermon and by the Holy Spirit he spoke out the words. It was called That's My King if you want to look it up on YouTube. It's where you get the full transcript, I think it's about eight, eight minutes long. But I'm only quoting a few sentences here. That's my king. This is what he says. You can't outlive him and you can't live without him. The Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. The witness couldn't get their testimony to agree. Herod couldn't kill him. Kill him. Death couldn't handle him. And the grave couldn't hold him. That's my king. Death couldn't handle him. The grave couldn't hold him. That's my king. And this theme of overcoming, this message of victory, is found throughout the book we're studying, the book of Revelation. In fact, in chapter 1, Revelation chapter 1 and verse 18, Jesus introduced himself to us, and this is what he said, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. I am the living one. I was dead and behold, I am alive forever. He was dead. We know that from the cross last week. He breathed his last. He didn't faint. He didn't fake it. He breathed his last. Or as it says in John 19, uh, chapter 19, that he cried out with a loud voice, Tetelestai, it is finished. In other words, the price is paid. The great transaction's done. Or as it says in Matthew 27, verse 50, Jesus cried out with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. It wasn't a whimper of, of defeat. It was a great cry of victory. It is finished. He died and he was buried and he rose again. As the other old hymn says, up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph or his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain and he lives forever with the saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. It was said that on the evening of uh, June the 18th in 1815, a man stood in the tower of England's Winchester Cathedral and he was looking out to sea anxiously for a purpose. And at last he found out what he found what he was looking for. It was a ship that was sending back signals to land. You see, what had happened was all of England was holding its breath with him, wanting to know the outcome of a war. Because their military leader, the Duke of Wellington, had gone to war against Napoleon Bonaparte, and you'd know it as the water the, the Battle of Waterloo. So as he stood on Winchester Cathedral Tower, this man waited to relay the news that would determine England's future. The signal came back just as this heavy fog was coming in and he could see the words, Wellington defeated. And our hearts, his heart sank. The news went out from station to station slowly. Wellington defeated. And it was a bit like these two uh, disciples along the Emmaus Road. They were defeated. Jesus, it looked like, had lost today. It looked like it was over. But then the fog lifted. You know the story probably. The fog lifted. The message clearly came. And we saw the estimate that Wellington defeated the enemy. And it turned to a message of victory. And that's the message of the cross and the resurrection. Jesus won the day. He defeated the enemy. And the key is, have we got the last part of the sentence? You know, he defeated the enemy. 
He's not defeated. He defeated the enemy. You can read 1 Corinthians 15, which is known as the Great Resurrection Chapter. It's 58 verses long, so it's quite lengthy, but it's all on the theme of the resurrection. Just going to give you a few little summaries from it. Just verses 3 and 4. This is what Paul says, I delivered unto you what, is, uh, what I'd received. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So he preached the message. Then in verse 14, he gives this hypothetical what if situation. He gets them to think, if Christ were not risen, that would mean that your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. He gets them to think a what if situation. It's a bit like I remember preaching on... Uh, John 3 16 and I took it the other way around I said what if God hadn't loved the world what if he hadn't sent his son and we started looking at that but then we said but God has loved the world he has sent his son and that's what Paul's doing here what if he hadn't risen and then he, he boldly states in verse down at verse 20 but now Christ is risen from the dead right down to verse 55 it says so, oh death where is your sting O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. What's that saying to us? Not only has he won the victory, but notice we have the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ today. We are made overcomers. And now for a little Greek lesson. You probably know the word already. The Greek word for victory is the word Nike. Nike. And if that looks vaguely familiar to you, you're maybe a sporty person, you've seen it on your sneakers, you've seen it on your baseball cap, or you've maybe seen it on your t-shirt. Um, Nike literally means victory or conquest. And Nike comes from a verb, which is Nikeo, N-I-K-A-O, looks very similar to it, which means to conquer, to prevail, to triumph, to carry off the victory, to overcome to overcome. In classical Greek, it meant to be victorious, both in a military and in a legal combat, to utterly vanquish. So this word nikeo, why am I telling you about it? Well, it occurs 24 times in the Bible. You'll find it once in Luke, once in the Gospel of John, you'll find it twice in Romans, five times in 1 John, and 15 times in the book of Revelation. So what does that tell you? It tells you, first of all, that John was fond of the word, but it also tells you that the book of Revelation has a lot to say about overcoming and walking out this victory life. So let me share a few examples that we've already read as we studied the book, but I haven't zoomed in on them uh, for, for a purpose. It says in his message to the seven churches of Revelation, chapters 2 and 3, the Lord includes in every message a remark about the overcomer and what he will receive. And when he uses the word overcomer, he's using the word nakeo that we just looked at. To him who overcomes, I will give. He says to each of the churches. In fact, Jesus was looking for overcomers to rise up in Ephesus, that church that had left his first love. He said, he who's an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the assemblies. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of my God, Revelation 2, 7. So he wanted overcomers to rise up in Ephesus. And he was looking for overcomers in the church of Smyrna too, in uh, chapter 2, verse 11. It says, he who is an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the assemblies. He who overcomes won't be harmed by the second death. I wonder will he find any overcomers in Pergamos? He certainly hopes so. For he said in chapter 2, verse 17, 
He who is in the ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the assemblies. To him who overcomes, to him I'll give of the hidden manna, and I'll give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written, which no one knows but he who receives it. Where are the overcomers, even in that place called Thyatira? Jesus says, two, chapter 2, verse 26, to him who overcomes, he who overcomes, and he who keeps my works to the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. Will he find overcomers in Sardis? Chapter 3, verse 5, he who overcomes will be arrayed in white garments, and I will in no way blot his name out of the book of life, and I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. And what's his promise to the overcomer in Philadelphia? He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will go out from there no more. I will write in him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and my own name. Chapter 3, verse 12. And even that last church we looked at, the church of Laodicea, that lukewarm church, he's looking for the overcomer. He says, he who overcomes, I will give to him to sit down with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Chapter 3 and verse 21. And each time of your reading in the Amplified, it says to him who overcomes is victorious, I will grant. So Jesus is looking for the overcomer in us. He expects us to carry off the victory because he has already won the victory. As Paul told us, as we just read in 1 Corinthians uh, 15, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So he's given us the victory. That's why he can expect us to live out the overcoming life. He's not asking us to do something that is impossible. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's followed on as we read, therefore, my beloved brethren, because he's given us a victory, we can be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labour is not in vain in the Lord or to no purpose. You see, because you and I have the victory and know the power of the resurrection, we can remain steadfast. We can be firm and stable, immovable, unmoved by circumstances, abounding in the work of the Lord. In fact, when it says to be steadfast, it literally means prove yourselves to be steadfast. Prove yourselves to be immovable. And continuing on in the book of Revelation, do you remember in chapter 12, in verse 11, it also talks about the tribulation saints, how they overcame. It says, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. Overcomers. And the same John who wrote the book of Revelation, also, as I mentioned, has used the word elsewhere. And in chapter, in his gospel, in chapter 16 and verse 33, Jesus says, I have, same verb, Nikeo, I have overcome the world. I'm going to read it to you in the verse. It says, these things I've spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage, I have overcome the world. And I love it in the Amplified Bible. I have to read it too. I've told you these things that in me you may have perfect peace and confidence. In the world you have tribulation and trials and distress and frustration. But be of good cheer, take courage, be confident, certain, undaunted. For I have overcome the world. In brackets, I have deprived it of power to harm you and have conquered it for you. Right. Conquered it for you. Jesus Notice, didn't promise us a carefree life. He didn't come to explain suffering or even to remove it. He didn't come to make us escapists, but overcomers. And to overcome, there has to be something to overcome. And he intended that we should live confident lives, in peace, even in our problems. In this world, you will have trouble. He said it clearly. 
But then he makes that amazing statement that in the midst of the tribulation or the trouble, we can be of good cheer. You know, the world is joy and happiness directly proportional to circumstances. Bad circumstances produce depression and sorrow, while good circumstances produce joy and peace. That's the way the world operates. But as Christians, it doesn't need to be that way. According to Jesus, we can overcome, we can nikeo the circumstances. He says, I have overcome the world. He didn't say, I will overcome the world. I have overcome the world. That's a perfect tense, which refers to a past activity with abiding results. A past activity with abiding results. And the word, as I say, translated overcome here, is that same word that was used in Revelation, that keo. I have overcome the world. We overcome because he overcame. That's simple. Standing on the finished work of Jesus, how can we be defeated? Do you remember how Habakkuk overcame the circumstances in his life? I love reading him. He says, though the fig tree doesn't bud, things weren't good. And there's no fruit on the vines, it was even worse. Though the product of the olive fails, and the fields yield no food, pretty bad. Though the flock is cut off from the fold, and there's no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will exult in the victorious God of my salvation, Verse 19, he says, the Lord is my strength, my personal bravery, my invincible army. He makes my feet like hinds feet and will make me to walk, not to stand still in terror, but to walk and make spiritual progress upon my high places of trouble, suffering and responsibility. That's an overcomer. Again, back to John. And in his letters, he uses the same word, nakeo. You know, 1 John 4.4 4 and 1 John 5.5, 5, that's easy to remember. 1 John 4.4, 4, you're of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. Or little children, you're of God, you belong to him, and have already defeated and overcome them, that's the agents of the Antichrist, because he who lives in you is greater, mightier, than he that is in the world. And 1 John 5.5, 5, for everyone who's born of God overcomes, Nikeo again, the world. This is a victory, Nike, that overcomes the world, even our faith. Who is the one that overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. So overcomers are people born of God. People who have put their faith in Jesus Christ. It's not just blind faith we're talking about here, but faith in Jesus Christ and an ongoing reliance and trust upon Jesus Christ and his words. Now go with me for a moment, please, to Romans chapter 8, because we're going to see this same word in a slightly different form. Romans chapter 8 and verse 37. It says, Knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. We need to read that verse in context tonight. What's Paul referring to when he says in all these things? What's he talking about? What's the situation? What are the circumstances? So let's read from verse 31. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God that justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall a tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it's written, for your sake we are killed all day long. 
We're accounted as sheep for the slaughter. And then we have our verse, yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present nor things to come, nor height nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So verse 37, yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Do you read in the Amplified? It says, yet amid all these things we are more than conquerors and gain a surpassing victory through him who loved us. Amid all these things. Sometimes we just think, oh, we'll have the victory for this side of it, if we're over it. But amid your situation, amid the circumstances, you can still be an overcomer. You can still be a victor because you have the victory. Amid all these things. Look closely. It says we are more than conquerors. We. Who's the we? That's referring to every true believer, those who have put their faith in Jesus Christ, those who have been predestinated, called, justified and glorified, as it mentions in verses 29 to 30 in the same chapter. We. We are. What tense is that? It's present tense, isn't it? It's not we will be, but we are. Present reality. We are. What are we? We are more than conquerors. More than conquerors. Three words in English that translates one word in the Greek. And it's quite a long word, but you know part of it. Hooper Nikeo. Hooper Nikeo. We got it? Yes, we have. Hooper Nikeo. Hooper is like our English word hyper or super. And Nikeo, as you know, means to conquer. So it literally means we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. We're more than conquerors. There's not a word for it in the English. More than conquerors. The strongest onslaught that the enemy can bring against us, we are able to effectively conquer with plenty of reserve. That's the meaning. So why are we more than conquerors or super conquerors? It tells us, we can't miss this, it is through him who loved us. Through him who loved us. Through him, there's no other way. Our victory doesn't lie within ourselves. Our victory rests in him, in Christ alone. Positionally, because of Jesus' death for us on the cross and his resurrection, it's absolutely true that we as believers are all overcomers and more than overcomers, more than conquerors. But the problem is practically, moment by moment, we have to walk this out as overcomers. And we have to not allow circumstances to rule. You know, many talk about being under the circumstances and under the weather. Well, Jesus is always talking about being over, being overcomers. And that's the way we need to see ourselves. We need to see ourselves the way the Bible says it is. We are more than conquerors. And if we're going to be overcomers, we need to take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And I know from personal experience that if I don't bring every thought in obedience to Christ every day, every moment of the day, I would find myself given into anxiety, to fear, and even despair of the moment. And that's why it's so critically that I put up that shield of faith and resist and quench every fiery dart that the wicked one would send my way. In other words, I need to renew my mind with God's word and have the mindset of an overcomer. The enemy, you see, wants you to believe that you are defeated, that you are the underdog, that I want you to feel rejected and discouraged. And we constantly need to overcome these thoughts. How? We simply renounce the lies of the devil and we announce the promises that God has said about us in his word. You say to yourself, I am more than a conqueror. God has said it. We are more than a conqueror through Christ. You announce what God has said about you. You either choose to believe the report of the wicked one or you choose to believe what God says you presently are. If God is for us, who can be against us? 
Look at the word circumstance. We've got it up here. Circumstance. Circumstance is literally two words. Circum, which means around you, things around you. And stance means the stand that you take in the middle of it all. You're standing. My question is, what is your stance in your circumstance tonight? Are you standing firm in the victory that Jesus has already won for you? Are you steadfast and immovable? Under no circumstances should we buckle because God himself has declared that we are more, more, more than conquerors in any and every situation. And you know, I woke up this morning about five o'clock and I was thinking about this, that many people just bail out before their breakthrough. You know, they give in just at that moment when their breakthrough is about to come. And I may be talking to somebody tonight on that. I was actually reading uh, David Wilkerson last night, and that's probably maybe what prompted it. Um, he was preaching a sermon, and it was on the parable of the sower. And he brought my attention to uh, a verse, and it was Luke chapter 8, I think it was verse 15, where it tells you the good seed, uh, about the good seed bringing forth the fruit. It says, with patience. And I've never seen those words before. He says, that's the key to understanding that parable, with patience. You know, the good seed comes about when you patiently wait upon the Lord. And with patience, I didn't even, I actually looked up my own Bible to make sure it was in there and it was there. With patience. But then I started thinking at five this morning, I was thinking of Moses, you know, when he went up in that mountain, uh, in Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments. The people were left down on the ground, 40 days down there. They grew impatient, didn't they? Where's that Moses got to? You know, it was God forsaken them as he brought them into the desert just to let them die in the desert. Those were the thoughts. And they gathered all the jewellery and they started to entertain themselves and they built the calf and started worshipping the idol and got into trouble. But the thing was, as they were doing that, Moses was on his way down. They grew impatient. You know, God, and that's what happens to many people, they just grow impatient. They've been praying for something and then they just grow impatient and they throw in the towel when the answer is already on its way. And I was thinking also of Saul. Do you remember Samuel had said to Saul to stay, to go to Gilgal and stay there? Remember the Philistines were about to attack them. They were gathering this huge army, more numerous than the sand and the seashore, apparently 30,000 chariots and I think it was 10,000 horsemen. There was a lot anyway. And they were gathering uh, to fight. And Saul was to stay at Gilgal and wait for Samuel to come. Uh, to offer the burnt offering and to do nothing until that was done. And he says it could take seven days, but to wait till he came. And Saul, five days came, Saul started getting impatient. The people of Israel were getting impatient. You know, where is the prophet? Where has he got to? And it tells you that when he had waited just the seventh day, it says, what did he do? He went, he said, bring me a burnt offering. And he offered the burnt offering as a peace offering, something he's not legally, by the law, allowed to do. That was pride. He offered the burnt offering, and it says just at the end of the burnt offering, Samuel appeared. And he says, what's this thing you've done? Why have you acted so sinfully? Impatience again. Impatience. And so the key is to wait on God. He's already given us a victory. The victory is coming in your situation. You have the victory even in the middle of the circumstance. He'll bring you through. He'll bring you through. Have patience. It says, thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph. Always leads us in triumph. And through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. Let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight for the privilege of knowing you and knowing the power of your resurrection. We thank you, Lord, that you are in, you indeed died for us and were buried and that you rose again according to the scriptures on the third day. We thank you that the grave could not hold you and death was not the victor, but you rose a victor from that dark domain. You rose with a mighty triumph over your foes. And you and you alone can declare tonight, I am he that liveth and was dead and I am alive forevermore and I hold the keys of hell and death. So we thank you that we serve you tonight. We thank you that because you live, we also can live tonight. 
And we thank you because you defeated uh, the enemy. You have given us a victory and you have made us more than conquerors. So Lord, help us in, in whatever circumstances we find ourselves tonight to have that perfect peace and confidence in our God and to be steadfast, to be immovable, to be always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that our labour in the Lord is not in vain. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And thank you all for joining us tonight.